All right, look with me, would you please, in the book of Philippians. We've spent a few weeks together traveling through the book of Philippians, and I'm thankful and trusting that the Lord has used this and using it in your life as he has in mine. And uh, we're looking today in Philippians chapter 4. I've given myself extra time today so that the test I promised you could be taken today. And before you're allowed to leave church and go home and have your lunch, you've got to score at least uh, 75, okay? And we will not be grading on the curve, so listen up. All right. Very good. Philippians, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your goodness. Bless now in this time that we've committed to your word. And Lord, may we be directed in our lives. We certainly will thank you, Lord, for what's accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me five minutes of review, please, because when we pack up the book of Philippians and we move on from this, I sure hope you'll have some of this stuff with you in your head, but more than that in your heart, because the book of Philippians is just packed full of things that God's people need to know about living and being directed towards. First of all, I would remind you that this is a letter that the Lord used the Apostle Paul to write to the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi was started on Paul's second missionary journey. It was the first church started on the continent of Europe. It came after Paul had a vision, come over to Macedonia and help us. Philippi was in a city that was on a highway, the Ignatian Highway, built by the Romans. There was a, a bustling city for trade and people from all over had come to Philippi. It was known for gold mines and known for fresh, clean drinking water. And so there were several things going on there that people were connected to. The other thing that we noticed about an attribute is that it was a Roman colony. And the people there would take great pride in that, that they had Roman citizenship and had the rights that belonged to the Romans. And that bears out when the Apostle Paul on two occasions emphasizes to them their citizenship or implying their citizenship being in heaven. And just as they had such an attachment to this earth and to the citizenship here, they should recognize that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were citizens in heaven. And I'm thankful for heaven today, and I know you are as well. And so the Lord, would use, the Lord would use the Apostle Paul four things primarily in this letter. One, to thank the people because they were generous. Not only had they given of their finances, but they had given of themselves. And at times when it was difficult for them, evidently in chapter 4, as we come to the concluding remarks, there's the promise that God would supply their need according to His riches and glory. And so I think at times maybe they gave even out of difficult times themselves. And so he thanked them for that. He also wanted to remind them of the gentleman that they had sent who was a fellow laborer and a good brother in that church, that man by the name of Aphroditus, who had brought to the Apostle Paul a gift, and offering that they had sent. And on his way he'd become ill. He was so ill he nearly died, but he continued on. And Paul wanted his testimony to be clear, and he wanted to thank the people for sending him. There was also direction. Chapter 3, we emphasized it last Sunday morning. There were people who had come in and were beginning to try to bring the people of God there in the church in Philippi under Judaism. And they were Judaizers. They were mingling Christianity with the Jewish law. And the Apostle Paul gave that strong correction on that. And he said, if anybody would be pleased in their flesh or find satisfaction in their flesh or find acceptance with God in their flesh, it would be him. And he gave that long list of things and he told the people to beware of that three times. Beware, beware, beware. And then we looked at uh, some of those false teachers and who they were last Sunday evening. There are several things that come out in this uh, the book of Philippians also to one of the other issues. It seems that maybe there was some tension or some issues between some of the folks in church, even to the point that two were named, and we read it a moment ago about what was happening there. And so there was good direction given. The Apostle Paul would speak from, as the Lord would have him to, from his heart about his mind and what his desire was. In chapter 1, he said that it was better for him to depart, but that it was more needful for him to remain, to be there with those folks. And from that we get that tremendous passage and that tremendous verse there about departing and staying and what the Lord would have for our life and serving others. And Paul said, regardless whether it would be imprisonment, whether it would be life or whether it was death, he didn't care what happened to his life as long as he magnified Christ. He wanted Christ to be magnified in his life. And then we see in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul trying to help the people of God to get along. And he told them how they were to behave and how they were to have the mind of Christ. And how they were to be like servants and serving one another and to, to be gracious towards each other. And then we come to chapter 4. And by name, two people are mentioned. And it seems like there was an issue there. And we touched on this last Sunday evening in closing that the Lord uh, Paul wanted these folks to get along. He wanted them to function well. I don't know of any pastor that doesn't want God's people to function well. 
It, it hurts, right? How about in a family? In our families, we want those members of our family to function well. As parents, we want our children to function well. We want them to get along with each other. We want them to be good to each other. Boy, it thrills my heart as a pastor when I see God's people being gracious to each other and being helpful to each other. I can't tell you the blessing it is when I travel in and out of people's lives and through their homes, you know, and I see where one member has sent a nice gift or a nice card to somebody to let them know that they're praying for them or provided a meal for somebody in a difficult time or you find out later on that there's there was uh, somebody in the church that really became a mentor and helped disciple somebody. Boy, that makes my, heart, makes my heart feel good, right? And if as a pastor my heart is towards the people of God, how much more is God? And the Apostle Paul said to those people that you are my, my joy and crown. He said, I want you to know what you mean to me because I want you to understand my heart here when I tell you that you need to get along. You need to be good to each other. You need to figure this thing out. Now in a church body there are many members and all members are important. In a church body like ours, there are people who come from various walks of life. There are people who come from different generations here. We've got some folks at our church, they remember the Great Depression. They remember what it was like. One of our dear men, he remembers what it was like. He said we would have uh, flour biscuits for breakfast and flour biscuits for lunch and flour biscuits for dinner. We'd get a bag of potatoes or a sack of potatoes and we'd have potatoes for breakfast and potatoes for lunch and potatoes for dinner. And he's appreciative of anything and all things. The reality today is that most, most children today wouldn't know what to do with a flour biscuit for breakfast and lunch and dinner. They wouldn't know what to do with potatoes for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And so generationally we have differences. We, we look at things a little bit differently, right? I'm always looking for a place to get a free cup of coffee. Huh? And some folks don't mind spending several dollars on a cup of coffee, right? And I, say, I would say, but that's a, I can go over to Home Depot there and they've got a free cup of coffee. And they say, yeah, but it's terrible. And I say, yeah, but it's free. <laughs> well, we want a free terrible cup or an expensive good cup. I'll stick with the free terrible, right? It's a generation thing. So, of course, we're going to look at things differently. We're going to have different tastes and different opinions about things. Culturally, we have people in our church. We thank the Lord for all whom the Lord brings. We have folks who have come and the, the America experience is relatively new to them. They don't get it. Certain things they're learning from us and they're picking up on. It's different. Different walks. Imagine people getting saved in Philippi, some from Roman backgrounds, some from Greek backgrounds, some from Hebrew backgrounds, and bringing all that in. And so with that, there comes that natural condition. It, it, and then we think of personalities. God made us all different in this sense. That's how we add to each other. We need the jokester who keeps us laughing. We need the guy who thinks he's funny so that we can laugh at that person, right? We need that guy. We need the Peters in the world who charge head first. And we need the Johns who are sensitive and listening for the heart of the Savior. It, it takes a lot of different things to function. And yet it's, it can't happen that along the way our passions and our purposes cross and we can hurt each other. We can have a falling out and we can have difficulty. And in our church family, oh, how we want to strive for unity. How do you have unity? How do you keep that? How do you have unity in your home? This passage in general speaks of peace, and that's where we're going to draw the majority of our preaching from this morning, peace. How do we have peace? First of all, I have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 tells me, well, go ahead and turn there. I love that verse. You can never read it too much. You can never see it too much. It's one that you ought to see and one that you ought to memorize. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore what? Being justified by faith, we have. Go ahead and turn there. I want you to see it. That's why I like for you to have a Bible. Therefore, being justified by what? Faith. I'm not, I could spend all morning on this verse, and I'm not going to, but to be justified, to stand before God as justified, it doesn't mean that I've been pardoned. It doesn't mean that God sees my sins and forgives me simply. To be justified is just as if I'd never sinned. When God sees me, He sees the righteousness of Christ. It's not my good works and my bad works and my good works outweigh it because it never would. It's to be justified. My standing with my Creator is that I'm justified. And there's only one who can justify me, and that's Jesus Christ, because He did what was necessary for that. It would be the propitiation, the payment for my sins. Therefore, being justified by church membership. Therefore, being justified by baptism. Therefore, being justified by good works. No, no, no. Therefore, being justified by what? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for what? Todd believed God. 
I believe God in November of 1984 and Hammond, Indiana, listened to a preacher preach on the tares and the wheats, and that evening I knew something in my life was not as it should be. The Lord dealt with my heart, and that evening I said, I'm a sinner under the condemnation of God, and I believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again for me, and I believe that's how I can have peace with God. And I believe, and I would, it wouldn't matter to me that evening if there was a million people, if the whole world had heard me that evening, I would have stood up and I would have said, I believe. I didn't care who saw it, right? The Bible says if you believe, you'll not be ashamed. You want the whole world to know, I believe, right? And I believed that, and from a heart of belief, it came out of my mouth. I believe. I believe. When did you believe? I love that song. Boy, choir, what a good job today. What a Christ-honoring song. Thank you for that. Brother Steve, what a good, what a good truth, huh? The greatest of all miracles, to be born again, a new creation, something new. That's what the Bible said, you got saved. Wow. Therefore, being what? Justified by faith. Say it out loud with me, would you please? We have peace. Doesn't say I'm looking for it. Doesn't say I'm longing for it. It says that I have it. When I have it, what does that mean? I have it. We have peace with whom? With God. Okay. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, notice, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the avenue. I have peace with God by faith through whom? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. I traveled through the door. Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the bread. I took the bread. I opened the door. I walked through it. I said, I believe. I believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again for my sin. He paid my sin debt. All I had to do, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I, I came to the one and only, the one that could save me, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, I believe what you did, you did for me. And I'm justified with God. That's my position. We have peace with God. I feel sorry for you today if you struggle with that. I feel sorry for folks who don't recognize the security of the believer, the, the, the fact that you were born again and you are now born and you have everlasting eternal life. If you wake up every morning and wonder whether or not you have peace with God, take that verse and claim that verse. There was a man back in history by the name of Martin Luther and he was brought up in Catholicism, and he was a mess. And he was looking and searching, and man, he got in the book of Romans, and he began to read things about being justified by faith, justified by faith. And he began to read things like this. He said, hold on a second. I don't have peace with God because of who I am or what I do or what I'm a part of or when I was born or where I was born or what I look like. I have peace with God because of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in him. Young person, if you're here today and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day. You need to today recognize that, dear friend, if you're here and you've heard all sorts of messages and mingled stuff, there it is, it's plain, it's clear, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Can you imagine what kind of relationship you would be in if you were wondering in and out if it was on, if it was hot, if it was cold, if it was based on you? I'm glad that we have a perfect God who provided a perfect salvation, a perfect lamb for us, and that we have righteousness because of him. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Okay? I have peace with the Lord. I have peace with God. That's my position. I have peace. It's mine. I, it's mine. I, that's what I have. And that peace that we have with God speaks almost in a sense of two warring people. And there's friction and there's fussing. And before Christ, that's what you have with God. You have friction and you have fussing. You don't see it. But the Bible says that we are enemies of His. We're opposed to Him. But when we come to Him through Christ, it's all settled. He's the mediator and He mediates that relationship. Now, God and man brought together by the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace. The Lord Jesus says in the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, he says, peace I give to you. He says, my peace I leave with you. I'm giving you peace. Peace speaks of tranquility. It speaks of being settled. That doesn't mean that around us storms don't swirl. It doesn't mean around us that there's not difficult things that are happening around us. But we have as believers, we have peace because of that relationship that we have with God. That's our position. God is no longer my enemy. And I'm not God's enemy. 
we have been reconciled, we have been brought together. Let that set in. Let that settle you. I don't know what tomorrow holds, and you don't know. I don't know what next year holds, and I don't know what the, everything about what's going to become of life for us. But I know this. I know that I have peace with God. If you have peace with God, that's something to build on. Peace with God. And so the Apostle Paul is selling the folks there. He's saying, listen, let me remind you of something. You're my joy. You're my crown. It bothers me to hear that you're not functioning as you should. I want you to do something. I want you to know... And I want you to stand fast in the Lord. I want you to be reminded of something. I want you to be reminded you, you have that same position with the Lord. Look at verse 2, and their names are mentioned there. And I want you to say that he's directing them in the conclusion of verse 2 that they be of the same mind where? In the Lord. Talk to you a moment ago about different backgrounds and things and how people see stuff, right? There are words, there are terms, quite honestly, that in my generation we didn't use. They were not, not that they were swear words or cuss words, they were just crude. They're crude words, and I think that they're, they're still crude to me. But I hear people use those words now, and I, boy, man, if my mother was around, what would she do with you, huh? She is around. Watch your mouth. I'll give her a bar of soap and let her come after you, right? <laughs> there are things that generationally I'm, I tend to be more sensitive to than others, and then I find that there are young, the younger generation is more sensitive to certain things than I am, right? I grew up with coaches who yelled at me. I grew up with coaches who, from time to time, would walk up alongside of me and give me a swift kick in the britches and say, get running faster. Some of you, you hear that, you say, oh. But I, growing up, thought that if the coach really liked you, he really motivated you that way. He was really after you, man. He was, you know, getting after you. He wasn't being unkind or rude or, or uh, anything to be considered that way. Just his way of motivating. Now, obviously, that's not the best approach. You don't do that today, Right? You'll lose your job. You can be a principal that dresses like a woman during the week and keep your job, but oh, hold on a second. I'll, I'll move past that. But God forbid an alpha male would try to make alpha males, you know. Anyhow, so we have these issues. We have things that we look at. So how, how, do, we get, how do we stay together? How do we work through things? Because not everybody's going to have this mind. It's a shame. Or this body. No, you yeah. Not everybody's going to have this. Not all going to see things the same way. What are we supposed to have? Look at this. That they be of the what? The same mind in the Lord. That's the most important thing right there, right? In the Lord. I never should let my opinions, I should never let my personality, I should never let those things that be so strong about me that I cannot function with God's people in the Lord when I'm centered around the Word of God. Nor should I ever make so much of myself that everybody has to bend to me. I should make much of Jesus so that we all kneel before him. And that's how we get along. That's how we function. We have the same mind in the Lord. We find out what the Lord wants for us. We, we, we are directed towards that. We come into submission to that. Philippians chapter 2, what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in what? Christ Jesus. And hey, listen, so the Apostle Paul's teaching me, he said, listen, if Jesus would humble himself and be obedient to God, even unto the death of the cross, then surely God's people can be obedient and have that same mind and learn to function well. Hey, how are we going to get the job done in this world? How will we be as the church in Philippi was directed? You're supposed to hold forth the word of life in a crooked and perverse generation. How will we be those people if we cannot let the peace of God that we have, our position, direct our relationships to be at peace? How about our homes? Do our homes demonstrate the peace of God? We have that position in Christ, but do we have that practice in our home? Are we at peace? It's what the Bible's talking about, submitting to one another and uh, being gracious and not uh, ha thinking more of others than oneself. It's to maintain what? Peace. The book of Romans says that we should be at peace with all men. We should strive to live at peace with our neighbors. How do we have this peace? Because first, positionally, I have that peace in Christ with God. That's my relationship. I'm settled. I'm good. You want to help a child, help that child to have good, solid relationships with those that are in leadership so that they can draw from that. I knew as a child that even though maybe relationships with others or interactions with others, maybe it wasn't always as I expected it to be, I knew that at home there was a father, there was a mother 
who loved me, who I was at peace with. And from that foundation I built. And that's what God wants for us to have as God's children. From that relationship that we have and that position of being at peace with Him to draw from that. Have the same mind in the Lord. There's an instruction there in verse 3. We touched on it last week that others would help people to have that. That we should be helping folks to get along. The last thing that people need when they're having a problem is people to stir it up. We're working towards that end. We're not against each other. We're for each other. Paul says to this church, the Lord needs you. The Lord's called you. The Lord's placed you there. Work together. In our church, there will be people who are mature, are further along believers, who are mature believers and have certain areas of their life established and settled. And there will be other people who are growing and coming along. There are some people who have higher expectations or higher standards than others. There are some people who would say, I would never do that, and the Lord has led me to not do that. And then you've got other folks who are coming out of a generation where they've never been taught any of that. They don't know that. They don't understand those things. Culture, it's not the same culture. If you look at America today, from where America was at in 1950, 1960, when some of us were coming up, 70s, 80s, it's different. You're going to make everybody pass your test before you work with them or help them or love them. Who are you going to find? The idea is that we have the same mind where? In the Lord. Get along. Be fellow laborers. Why? Be reminded of something. Your names are written where? In the book of life. Very quickly, I have the position of peace in Christ. That's my position. We're given now some statements here that are the practice of peace. How to have peace in your life. How to, ha how to experience peace. How to take that position and have it. Because I'm telling you, I've pastored some folks over the years who do not have this tranquil, peaceful position or disposition in their life. How do we have this? Take your Bible, would you turn with me please, very quickly, to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I want you to see something here. Mark chapter 4. In verse 39, Mark 4 and verse 39, And he, that he is Jesus, arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the Bible says, And the wind ceased, and there was a great what? A great calm. Now in my relationship with God, Jesus has brought a great calm. I'm at peace with God. And I believe that the peace that the Lord Jesus brings into our life is a calm in our life. It's the storms being under the command and the directives of the Lord to be stopped and for the seas to be seized. It is a heart that is still and waiting on the Lord and not tossed to and fro by the problem. It's calm. It's being able to say even in the midst of great things and great difficulties, it is well with my soul. It may not be well in my life. It may not be well in my wealth. It may not be well in my health. But it is well in my soul. I am calm. Jesus brought that peace to you. That peace is drawn from that relationship that you have with God. From that, learn to be at peace with others. The practice of peace, one, is right relationships. How do we keep those? Number one, to recognize that we're in this thing together and defending the gospel. Number two, to love one another and to keep one on your mind or to think higher of others than yourself. To esteem the other. To be of one accord in the mind of the Lord. Right relationships. How much of our peace is taken from us because we just simply don't get along with people. This is not what the Lord would have for us. Then I want you to notice with me verse 4. If you'll allow the expression attitude, I'll use the word attitude and I'll give explanation. The practice of peace, right relationships. The practice of peace, right attitudes. Verse 4 says this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say what? Rejoice. rejoice. In chapter 3 we looked at some of the things that we're rejoicing in. Our standing, 
justification, salvation, passing from death unto life. We are to be in a continual pattern when it comes to having peace, to considering what the Lord has done for us and rejoicing in that. Rejoice. I, it may not fit the, be the best theological explanation of it, but to me rejoicing is joy heated up. Joy heated up. When you have something that's good, when there's a good meal, right? And you get it out and you have leftovers. Leftovers are okay, right? It depends on what they were to begin with. <laughs> when you have something that was good and you take that leftover out, now, I don't know how it works for you, but there are certain things that my wife makes that I really like. She made homemade meatballs and homemade spaghetti sauce this week from fresh tomatoes. And I always say, hey, I'll make enough there so we, you know, sustain me for a while. And I suspect I had it a few nights in a row, man. I had it with everything else she was making. I said, is there any more of that spaghetti sauce, any more of those meatballs? Yeah. I get them out, heat them up. I'd get in the car, headed home, begin to think to myself about what's going to be for dinner. And I think, oh, there's some more of that tomato sauce. We came down and all the noodles were gone and all the meatballs were gone, but there was still a cup of tomato sauce. That's right. I heated it up and drank it, man. I like it. Why, it's good. I'm getting excited thinking about it. I wouldn't mind having it again today. I love them. Oh, man, they're good. I'm going up. I'll leave it at that. I'm, it's hungry. I'm hungry. It's noon. But I reheat those things. We go home, put them in the microwave. Man, I enjoy it again. Enjoy it again. And that's rejoicing. Rejoicing is that joy of the Lord and reheating it and stirring it up in your life on a regular basis. Man, that helps us to be what? Helps us to be at peace. It helps us to be calm. We begin to have problems in my life, and we say, I don't know if the Lord, what, what's going to happen here? Well, when you rejoice, you're reminding yourself, you're rejoining those things and those events, that joy and that experience of joy in your heart, and it's stirring that up that, hey, the Lord saw me through before, the Lord will see me through again. I can rejoice in that. It also softens the sting of frustration. You have a problem or difficulty in life, and we all do. Let me help you here. I write you a prescription on how to help yourself. Just get a little help through it. Go and sit down somewhere and get you out a piece of paper and a pen and start writing down all the things that you're rejoicing in. What the Lord has done, who the Lord is, what the Lord has in store. Boy, you're going to have the same situation, but you will be different. Why? Because you're rejoicing. Peace comes, catch it. Number one, right relationships. Number two, a right attitude, an attitude of rejoicing. I want you to notice the next statement. Let your moderation, verse 5, be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your moderation. So one time this word is used. It speaks of something. It speaks of my behavior. It speaks of who I am. It speaks of how I handle things. There are several words that people would use to give definition to this. Forbearance, gentleness, courtesy, or, and softness. It's my disposition. See, my attitude is rejoicing, and my disposition of, is what? It's a disposition of gentleness. Oh, no, don't mistake that. Gentleness is not getting run over. Gentleness is not knowing where you stand. We're standing in the Lord. We're standing fast in the Lord. But I'm standing for the right things the right way. Moderation. Let your moderation be known unto who? All men. Not just the people in your church, but the people in the world. You see, one of the reasons why we are losing the fight it's because we make more of ourselves than we do of truth. We make it about what bothers me and what my issues are and what frustrates me. And what we ought to do is take people to the Word of God and say, Oh, listen, this is not about me. This is about God and about God's Word. This is about your life. This is about your direction in life. This is about your salvation. This is about your service to the Lord. Let your moderation. What's the preacher called to be? He's called to be long-suffering. Right? He's called to be forbearing. Be patient, not giving up on folks, not getting in the flesh and flaring up and give, throwing the towel in. Say, hey, I'm going to hang in there. We'll do right. We're going to do right. It's who we are. We know who we are. We know what we believe. We know why we believe it. But we're going to be like our Savior. And how was he? Like a lamb to the slaughter. Meek. That's who Jesus was. Let this mind be in you. That's what you see in the Apostle Paul's testimony. 
Paul knew his rights. He appealed to Caesar because he knew his rights as a citizen. But when they came to lock him up, what did he do? He went. And when he was there, what did he do? He served. You know, sometimes we get this attitude in our heart and our directive and our, our temperament. We make it more about ourselves than we do about the Lord and having the right mind in things. I don't ever want my disposition to overpower and to ruin my position. And some of us are opinionated. How many of you are opinionated? Yeah. Stubborn. Yeah, yeah. Outspoken. Well, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, all right, I get it. But that can sometimes not be that moderation. We are to make much of whom? Jesus. Before people hear all of my opinions and all this about this and the other, they ought to hear about Jesus. And then as there's opportunity, you may give, be given that chance to explain why you have opinions and how they're formed by the Word of God and what your worldview is by the Word of God. But the primary thing is what? It's Christ. Shake your head up and down there. I'll go for another hour. I've got enough notes for three weeks. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? Look at this next statement. The Lord is at hand. Twofold application. Number one, living in light of the Lord's return. That's something that all believers should be expecting, that the Lord is coming back, right? That there is more to come, that the Lord Jesus has more in store for the earth. He's got more in store for God's people. But I think another practical application of that is just to say the Lord's with you. The Lord's at hand. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you're dealing with. You don't think He can take care of you? You don't think He can handle it? You don't think He can re refute this or deal with this? This was Jesus. Remember those guys were down in the boat. We read it a moment ago in the book of Mark. The preceding verse was, hey, Lord, don't you care? We're going to perish. Jesus woke up and he went up and said what? Peace. Be still. It's not there. But then he think, I think he said, now let me go back to sleep. I'm tired, right? Did the Lord care? The Lord knew. The Lord knew everything was going on. He was able to deal with it. The Lord is at hand. You can trust him. You can rely on him. You can allow the mind of Christ to affect you. The Lord is at hand. Jesus went to the garden. In the garden he experienced self-suffering. Was the Father at hand? Was the work and was the will of God being accomplished in his life? I can trust him. I can rely on him. I can rest in him. Look at this, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We have considered the position of peace. That's what Christ does for us. We have recognized the practice of peace, and that is my interaction with others having peaceful relationships. We've looked at our attitude, the attitude of peace, and that's rejoicing in the Lord. We've looked at what I would call the behavior of peace, and that is moderation and that, that disposition of life and that direction in life of recognizing the Lord is at hand. He's got greater purposes in hand, and He's also in my life now to help and to support and to defend and to lead me. I, he's, he's got me. He is the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He, what? He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely. Why? He's my shepherd. I can trust him. He's my Lord. He's at hand. Lord, bear me up. Bear me up, Lord. You know, I will. I do. This is that peace. That's why when we receive word and news that troubles us and we're overwhelmed, like the men in the ship, we come to Jesus. We say, Jesus, only you can deal with this. I'm trusting you. And let me tell you, when Jesus is on board, you're in good hands. Amen. And he's given you a sweet and precious promise. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is at hand. Then when those things come into our life, when there are problems, and this church had their share of difficulties. They had bad teaching. They had people coming in causing problems. They had frustration between each other. They had those situations. What are we to do with those things? The Bible says this, verse 6, be careful for nothing. Now, this isn't a general expression of be careful not to be cautious. I gave the illustration this morning here recently. In the last few months, I heard of a gal who had had a, was involved in parachuting, and she had so many hundreds of jumps she became so familiar with jumping out of airplanes one day when they were having a jump, she ran and jumped out of the plane, forgetting her parachute. 
So the Bible's not saying, don't be careful about, you know, you know yeah, don't worry about putting your seatbelt on. Don't be careful for that. Oh, no, hey, you go to get some food out of the refrigerator, the milk out of it. Don't worry about the date. Just drink it up. It'll, no, that's not it. Talking about careful. It's talking about things that come upon us. Well, they come to us. What am I to do with these things? Those things that upset me, those things that cause me to worry or bring anxiety into my life or stir me. Are you ever stirred? Ever anxious? You wake up in the middle of the night, two o'clock, three o'clock. What is it about that hour? Huh? Man, I go to bed nine, ten, eight, the older I get, seven. <laughs> Lay my head down on my pillow, man, I'm gone. I can wake up in the middle of the night still just as tired as I could possibly be, and there I'm staring at the ceiling. I'm listening to the fan. I'm looking out the blind in the window and looking at my neighbor who has a porch light that shines right into my eyes. I want to shoot that porch light. Porch light, let's be clear. Right? All of a sudden, man, in, in the middle of the night, everything you begin to think about, right? It's amazing the clarity of thought because for a moment in your life, and the busyness of your day when you move from one thing to the next and you got to keep your mind on those things, there in that stillness of that moment, everything. Oh, I need to do this. Wish I hadn't done that. Oh, what about this? What about that? Oh, Lord, let me go back to sleep. What do I do at that time? Be careful for nothing. Lord, me laying here worrying about all this is not changing a thing, any of it. Here's what I can do with this. I can bring it to you. I can give it to you. It's yours, Lord. Handle it. Deal with it. You're at hand. You love me. You've given me peace with God. I'll, I give this to you, Lord. You know what I do the next day? Give it to him again. And the next day, give it to him again. And give it to him again. And how do we give it? Look what the Bible says. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by, first of all, by what? By prayer. This word prayer here speaks of a particular type of prayer. It speaks of a devotional prayer. It speaks of a scheduled or regimented prayer life. It speaks of having a time where you worship God. You want to have a secret to peace? Spend time with God every day. Fall in love with the Word and fall in love with being with God. Just learn and develop it. Ask the Lord to give you a heart for it. And start small and take baby steps and grow in that and develop that. But it's a tremendous way to experience peace. You have peace. Now I want to experience it in my life. I want it to permeate all the areas of my life. Right? Like your house. You get one of those candles ladies have got. I was visiting with one of our families here the other day. And man, everywhere I went in that house, it smelled. I thought for sure she was making some kind of sweet dessert or something. And I thought, man, I, you know, this is melting my walk through the front door, smelling at the back door, walking around thinking, I wonder if they're going to offer me something. You know? <laughs> I mean, how long? You know, I've got, got to ask. I guess if i got to ask, you know, I'll do it. So I'm walking through. I'm getting closer to the kitchen. Man, it's, oh, this is, wow, I don't know what it is, but it's really good. And I said, hey, what, what are you baking? It smells really good. And she says, oh, it's that candle in there on the table. Candle? I can't eat a candle. Right? You know the peace of God? Like that candle in your life. It's a flame and it puts off a fragrance. And the Lord wants in every area of your life for the peace of God to be sensed. For that odor, a good odor, a pleasing odor to be upon things. God doesn't want his people frustrated and anxious with each other. God doesn't want his people frustrated and anxious over things in life. He's, the Lord Jesus gave the example what? Consider the lily. Get the bird. Oh, I saw a hummingbird this week. That hummingbird, man, he was going to it. Somebody had set a little hummingbird feeder up, man. He had his nose in there, that beak in there, and he was going to town. Happy as could be. And I thought to myself, man. Wow. I watched a little baby run down a driveway this week, excited about grass, excited about a little bicycle, excited about all the people that were around the person, that little baby. I thought, man, wouldn't that be, what a great way, what a great life to trust God, take him in his word. It doesn't mean we just float through life and we have no direction or directives. 
but we understand as the people of God what we have. And it stills us, it calms us, it brings us to that spot, we know that. So preacher, boy, they're talking about the economy being bad. Well, what's gonna happen? Did you know that God doesn't look every day to see how the Dow Jones ended? You know that God doesn't look to see what the gold standard is? Consider the lily. Look at the sparrow. So I take care of them, I'll take care of you. It may not be the way you want, but God will not leave his people destitute. See, that calming that comes in, it takes us to prayer. Supplication, that's when things come upon us very quickly. We come to the Lord and we pour out our heart as a child. And we say, Lord, i got to have your help. i got to have you involved in this. That supplication comes built on a life of devotional prayer, of spending time in prayer. And then it's the natural response. I'm overwhelmed. Lord, I need help. Lord, there's a problem. Lord, there's a situation. God, I need to see you get involved in this. I want you to. I need you to. I need you, Lord. I'm leaning on you. That's the supplication. And there's thanksgiving. Always with what? Thanksgiving. What does Thanksgiving do when you're making your request known to God? It reminds you of what God has done and what God can do. God, look at this problem, but thank you, God, for, oh, you fixed this, you did this, you did that. You can handle this with Thanksgiving. You see, prayer doesn't just change things. More than that, it changes you. It affects you. You're still. You're called. You're directed. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be specific, and I must conclude things here. So we've talked about the position of peace that I have with Christ, with God. We've talked about the practice of peace, and that's having and maintaining and asking, getting the Lord involved in right relations to the same mind as the Lord in those relationships, knowing that their names are written in the book of life, and then we've seen the practice of peace, and that's a good attitude, right attitude. Right relationships, right attitude, or rejoicing attitude, right? Right disposition moderation, knowing the Lord is at hand, that He'll protect me, that He'll lead me, that He's the Good Shepherd. And then a life of prayer, coming to Him. I really believe if you'll latch on to that and practice that, that you're going to see here exactly what the Scripture says, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through whom? That's how you release that, so to speak. That's how you become engaged in that when you have these things. This is a practice. This is a pattern of behavior. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Hold on a second. We've talked about world peace. We've talked about positional peace. We've talked about the peace that Jesus brings. Now this is another peace. It's the peace that passeth what? Well, what does that mean? It means you can't understand it. That's that peace that you experience when you're going through something. And you say, you know what? I don't understand it, but I really believe that the Lord's going to see me through. I don't, I, this is probably not something where I should be rejoicing. I mean, you know what? I, I, I'm going to come through this. I was thinking about that this morning, and I was driving up Sheik Road, coming to the church. Well, what a beautiful sunrise we had today. And the sun was in my face, and I felt the warmth of the sun, and I said, this is the peace that passes understanding. This is to know that no matter what I'm going through, the Lord is there. The sun's coming up. I can't explain it, but the Lord's going to carry us through, and He does. We want to have that in our life. That's experience. So oftentimes, you know, I want to be careful. I always want to live by truth and not just feeling. But I have to tell you something. We have a God who is an emotional God. We have a God who has, does give, bring to His people experience. And there's something about this peace that nobody can really put their finger on. Only God can bring. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time we could spend in your word. We trust now, Lord, that you'll use it in our lives. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Just a matter of invitation here this morning. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you at peace with God? Has there been a time in your life, as I described in mine, when you came to Christ and you said, I believe? I believe, Jesus, that you lived and died and rose again for my sins. I believe that. I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. Sometimes we would ask the, the question this way, do you know for sure if you were to die that heaven would be your home? Do you know that you're at peace with God? Do you have that? If you're here this morning, you would say, Preacher, I understand that. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm at peace with God. I know that. Would you raise your hand? you say, Preacher, I know that I'm at peace with God, that I'm saved. 
put your hand down. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I do not know that. You could not raise your hand a moment ago. Friend, I would really encourage you right there at your seat. Won't you really consider those things that I did as a junior high boy? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. We all miss the mark. None of us measure up to God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the gift of God, that's what I don't deserve, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. How do you receive a gift? You take it by faith. You believe it. I believe Jesus lived and died and rose again for me by faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm being very, very simple here in very simple terms, but the Lord is saying to you, if you believe that you're a sinner and you believe that I lived and died and rose again for you, then receive me, believe on me. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Preacher, right here, right now at my seat, I see my need for Christ as my Savior. And I believe that I'm a sinner, and I believe the only way for my sins to be forgiven is by faith in Jesus Christ not just in who he is, but what he's done. That he lived a perfect life, that he died for my sins, that he rose again, victory over death, that I might have life and the forgiveness. You say, preacher, right here at my seat, I believe that and I want to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Who would say, preacher, please pray for me. I need to receive Christ as my Savior. Would you raise your hand this morning and say, preacher, please pray for me. I want to know that. I want to have that confidence. I want to know that. Who else would say that today? Preacher, I need to be saved. Please pray for me. I have questions about that. Here in just a moment we'll have an invitation. We've talked about peace today, the position and the practice of peace. How's the Lord dealt with you? If the Lord, maybe there's a situation, maybe there's a person, maybe there's something going on in your life, I trust that you'll allow the Lord to minister to your heart through His Word. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We'll ask the pianist to play.